Book 17. Contending for a soldier fallen in the midst of the great fight the eye of Menelaus, dear to the war god, had seen Patroclus brought down by the Trojans. Now he came forward in his fiery bronze through clashing men to stand astride the body, protective as a heifer who has dropped her firstborn calf, she stands above it, lowing, never having known birth pangs before. So, over dead Patroclus, Menelaus planted his heels, with compact shield and spear thrust out to kill whoever might attack him. One whose heart leaped at Patroclus' fall was the son of Panthus, Euphorbos. Halting nearby, he said to Menelaus, son of Atreus, nobly bred, Lord Marshal, yield, leave the corpse, give up his bloody gear. No Trojan hit Patroclus in the fight before I hit him. Let me have my glory. Back, or I'll take your sweet life with one blow. Hot with anger, red-haired Menelaus growled, Father Zeus, this vanity and bragging offends the air. A lion or a leopard could not be so reckless, or a boar, baleful with pounding fury in his ribcage, the sons of Panthus are bolder, more headlong than these. But youth and brawn brought no triumph or joy to Hyperina, when he sneered at me and fought me. Feeblest of all Danans he called me. Never on his own feet, I swear, did he return to gladden wife and kin. I, and you, I'll break your fighting heart if you stand up to me. Give way. Don't challenge me, get back into the ruck before something happens to you. Any fool can see a thing already done. The other took no heed but answered, Now, by God, you will give satisfaction for my brother, the man you killed and boast of having killed, leaving his bride lonely in her new chamber, his parents harrowed by the loss. I might become a stay against their grief if I could put your head and shield and helm in Panthu's hands, in the fair hands of Frontis. Come on, no more delay in fighting out the test of this, we'll see who holds his ground, who backs away. And at these words he struck the other's shield. The bronze point failed to break it, bending at impact on the hard plate. Then in his turn Menelaus made his lunge, calling on Zeus. The spearhead pierced the young man's throat at the pit as he was falling back, and Menelaus with his heavy grip drove it on, straight through his tender neck. He thudded down, his gear clanged on his body, and blood bathed his long hair, fair as the graces, braided, pinched by twists of silver and gold. Think how a man might tend a comely shoot of olive in a lonely place, well watered, so that it flourished, being blown upon by all winds, putting out silvery green leaves, till suddenly a great wind in a storm uprooted it and east it down, so beautiful had been the son of Panthus, Euphorbos, when Menelaus killed him and bent over to take his gear. And as a mountain lion cuts out a yearling from a grazing herd, the plumpest one, clamping with his great jaws upon her neck to break it, and then feeds on blood and vitals, rending her, around him dogs and herdsmen raise a mighty din but keep away, unwilling to attack, as pale dread takes possession of them all, so not one Trojan had the heart to face Menelaus in his pride. He might with ease have borne Euphorbo's gear away, had not Apollo taken umbrage and aroused Hector, peer of the swift war god, against him. In a man's guise, in that of Mentes, lord of Caconis, Apollo said, Lord Hector, here you are chasing what cannot be caught, the horses of Achilles. Intractable to mortal men they are, no one could train them except their master, whom a goddess bore. Meanwhile Menelaus, dear to ours, stands guard over Patroclos. He has killed a princely Trojan, son of Panthus, Euphorbos, putting an end to his audacity, his high heart. Turning back, once more the god entered the moil of men. But heavy pain bore down on Hector's darkened heart, and peering along the ranks in battle he made out one man loosing the armour of the other, prone on the field, his gashed throat welling blood. Then Hector shouldered through the fight, his helmet flashing, and his shout rose like the flame of Hephaestus' forge, unquenchable. It blasted Menelaus, and cursing in his heart the Achaean said to himself, What now? If I abandon this good armour, leave Patroclos, who lies here for my honour's sake, I hope no Danans may see me to my shame. But if I fight alone in pride, they may surround me, Hector and the other Trojans, God forbid, many against one man. And now Hector is leading the pack this way. Why go on arguing with myself? To enter combat when the will of God's against you, to fight a man God loves, that's doom, and quickly. No Danan will lift his brows at me for giving ground to Hector, Hector goes under God's arm to war. If I could only spot Aias anywhere, we too might brace in joy of battle, and contend once more, even against God's will, to bring the body back to Achilles, somehow. That would be making the best of it. But while he pondered, Trojan ranks came on, as Hector led them. 
backward at last he turned, and left the body, facing about at every step, the way a bearded lion does when dogs and men with spears and shouts repel him from a farmyard, and hatred makes his great heart turn to ice as he is forced from the cattle pen. Just so, forced from Patroclos, tawny Menelo step by step retired, then stood fast on reaching the main body of his men. Meanwhile he kept an eye out for great Aias, the son of Telamon, and all at once he saw him, on the far left of the battle, cheering his men, to make them stand and fight, for Apollo put wild fear into them all. Menelos ran to his side and said, Aias, come, good heart, we'll make a fight of it near Patroclos, try to bring his body back to Achilles, though he lies despoiled, his gear in Hector's hands. This call went straight to the fighting heart of Aias, and he followed Menelos down the field. Meanwhile when he had stripped Patroclos of his armor, Hector pulled at the corpse, now to behead it and give the trunk to Trojan dogs. But Aias came up then, his great shield like a tower, and Hector fell back on the waiting ranks to mount his car. The splendid arms of Achilles he gave to soldiers to be borne to town, his trophies, his great glory. And still Aias, extending his broad shield above Patroclos, stood as a lion will above his cubs when a hunting party comes upon the beast in underbrush, leading his young, he narrows eyes to slits, drawing his forehead down. So Aias took his stand above Patroclos, while Menelos, dear to the war god, stood nearby and let his grief mount up. Now Glaucos, Hippolocos son, captain of Lycians, glaring at Hector, had harsh words for him, Hector, you are a great man, by the look of you, but in a fight you're far from great. That's how it goes, a big name, and a craven. Put your mind on how to save your town with troops born here at Ilion, no others. Not one Lycian goes into combat after this for Troy. What have we gained, battling without rest against hard enemies? How would you save a lesser man in war, you heartless fraud, if you could quit Sarpedon, comrade in arms and guest as well, and leave him to be the Argive's prey and spoil? In life he was a great ally to you and Troy, and yet to keep the scavenging dogs from him, you had no heart for that. Here's what I say, if any of the Lycians obey me, we are for home, and let doom fall on Troy. If the Trojans had spirit, had that unshakable will that rightly comes to men who face for their own land the toil and shock of war, would pull Patroclos into Ilion quickly. And were he brought in death to the great town of Priam, if we dragged him from the fury, the Argives would return Sarpedon's arms, his body, too, for us to carry home to Ilion in fair exchange. For he who perished here was the dear friend of a great prince, greatest by far of those who hold the beach and their tough men at arms. But as for you, you did not dare meet Aias, face to face and eye to eye, in the din of battle, or engage him. Why? Because he is a better man than you are. Hector in his shimmering helmet frowned and answered him, so young, and yet so insolent? Old son, I had thought you a steady man, coolest of those who live in Lycia. Now I despise your thought. Nonsense to say I would not meet you, Gyas. When have I shown fear of swordplay, or of trampling horses? Strongest of all, though, is the mind of Zeus who bears the storm cloud, he can turn back a champion, and rob him of his triumph, even when he incites the man. Come here, my friend, stand by me, watch me in action. All day long I'll be the coward you describe, or else you'll see me stop the enemy cold no matter how he fights to shield Patroclos. To the Trojans now he gave a mighty shout, Trojans, Lycians, hard-fighting Dardanoi, be men, old friends, remember your own valor, while I put on Achilles' beautiful arms, taken from Patroclos when I killed him. Then in his shimmering helmet Hector turned to leave the deadly fight, and running hard he caught up soon with his platoon of soldiers, they were not far, bearing the great man's armor up to the city. Hector stood there then, apart from all the dolorous war, and changed. He who had given those arms to be carried back into the proud town, to the folk of Troy, now buckled on the bright gear of Achilles, Peleus' son, that gear the gods of heaven granted his father. He, when old, bestowed it on a son who would not wear it into age. And Zeus who gathers clouds saw Hector now standing apart, in the hero's shield and helm, and nodded, musing over him, Ah, poor man, no least presage of death is in your mind, how near it is, at last. You wear the gear of a great prince. Other men blanch before him. It is his comrade, gentle and strong, you killed, and stripped his head and shoulders of helm and shield without respect. Power for the time being I will concede to you, as recompense, for never will Andromache receive Achilles' arms from you on your return. He bent his great head, over his black brows, and made the arms fit Hector. Then fierce ours entered the man, his bone and sinew thrilled with power and will to fight. 
among his men he shouldered forward with a mighty shout, flashing in the armor of Achilleus, and stirred each man he came abreast of, Mestals, Glaucos, Medon, Thersilocos, Asteropios, Dazena, Hippothus, Phorkes, Chromios, and the seer of birds, Enomos. In a swift speech he urged them, Hear me, hosts of neighbors and allies, not from desire for numbers or display did I enlist you, bring you from your cities here to Troy. You were to save our wives and children from the Achaeans, our besiegers. And I deprive my people to that end with requisitioning for you, supplies, to build your strength and strength of heart. Go forward, every man, therefore, to meet destruction or to come through, these are the terms of war. Patroclus has been killed indeed. Whoever pulls his body to our charioteers, if Ias can be made to yield to him, that man wins half our spoils when I allot them. I myself take half, so glory equal to my own is his. At this they surged ahead and bore down hard with lifted spears on the Danans. High hopes they had of dragging off the corpse from Ias, fools, for he took their lives, many, upon it. To Menelos, clarion in battle, Ias now said, Old timer, Menelos, I see no hope for us of getting back, all on our own, out of this fight. My fear is less for the dead body of Patroclos, glutting the dogs and birds he may be, soon, than for my life and yours, in mortal peril. Hector's a battle cloud, covering everything. Our death looms in that cloud. Call to our champions, if they can hear you. Menelos complied, and high and clear made himself heard by the Danans, friends, captains and lords of Argives, all who drink with Agamemnon and with Menelos wine of the peers, and all those in command of men-at-arms, glory from Zeus attend you, I find it hard to pick out single men, the action being so hot, but let each one come forward on his own against the shame of seeing Trojan dog sport with Patroclos. Ias the runner, son of Oileus, heard distinctly and came first through battle on the run, Idomeneus came next, and his retainer, Meriones, peer of the murderous war god. Then the rest, and who could name so many in his mind, who came up afterward to rouse the action. Now the Trojans charged, all in a mass, led by Hector. As at a river mouth a big sea thunders in against the stream, high banks resound, and spume blows from the surf, so came the Trojans shouting. The Achaeans formed a line in singleness of heart around Patroclos, walled by brazen shields. And Zeus the son of Cronos poured thick mist about their shining helms, for in the past Patroclos never had offended him while he lived on as the comrade of Achilleus, now he hated to see him pray to dogs and stirred his friends to fight for him. First, though, the Trojan impetus bent the Achaean line back from the dead man, wavering, though not one could Trojan spearmen kill, for all their passion. Now they pulled at the corpse, but not for long were the Achaeans to be parted from it, Ias made them spring back, he whose bulk and feats of war surpassed all the Achaeans after Prince Achilleus. Plunging ahead, he broke the Trojans, valorous as a boar in mountain land who scatters dogs and men with ease, wheeling upon them in a glade. Even so the son of Telamon, magnificent Ias, whirled about and broke the clump of Trojans that had ringed Patroclos thinking now surely to drag away the body to their own town, and win a claim for it. I, the illustrious son of the Pelasgian Lethos, Hippothus, looping his sword belt around the tendons at the ankles, drew the body backward on the field of war to win favor with Hector and the Trojans. Black fate came to him, none could deflect it. Ias leaping through the melee struck his helm with brazen cheekplates, round the point the ridge that bore the crest crumpled at impact, cleft by a great spear in a massive hand. His brains burst, all in blood, out of the wound as far as the spearhead socket. On the spot his life died out in him and from his hands he let Patroclo's foot fall to the ground as he pitched forward head first on the body, far from Larissa S. Rich farmland, nor ever would he repay his parents for their care, his life being cut short by the spear of Ias. There and then, with spear point flashing, Hector lunged at Ias, Ias saw it coming and dodged the bronze point by a hair. Instead the shock came to the son of Iphitos, Scedios, a Phocian hero, who had lived as lord of many in renowned Panopeus. Now the spear caught him under the collarbone, the bronze point cut through to his shoulder blade, and down he crashed, his war gear clanging on him. For his part, Ias hit the son of Phanops, veteran Phorkes, in the middle belly just as he came up to Hippothous. The spearhead broke his cuirass at the joint and pierced his abdomen. Fallen in the dust, he clutched the earth with hand outspread. His men fell back, then, so did Hector, and the Argives gave a loud cry as they dragged off the bodies of Phorkes and Hippothous, ripping from their shoulders gear of war. 
At that point, under pressure from Achaeans and overcome by their own weakness, Trojans might have re-entered Ilion, beyond the limit set by Zeus the Argives might have won the day by their own heart and brawn. Not so, Apollo now inflamed Aeneas, taking the form of Epito's son, Periphas, a crier, and a kind man, who had aged in the crier's duty, serving old Anchises. In that disguise Apollo son of Zeus said, How could men like you save Ilion, Aeneas, overriding heaven's will? In other days I've seen men put their trust in their own strength and manhood, or in numbers, and hold their realms, beyond the will of Zeus. And now in fact Zeus wills the victory far more for us than for Danans. Amazing, the way you shrink from battle. Facing him, Aeneas recognized the archer, Apollo, and shouted then to Hector, Hector. All captains of Trojans and allies. What shame to go back into Ilion, spent and beaten. Here, standing near me, is a god who tells me Zeus on high is our defender, Zeus, master of battle. Come, we'll cut our way through the Danans, and God forbid they take Patroclo's corpse aboard ship at their leisure. At this he leapt ahead and took position forward of his line. The rest swung round and faced the Achaeans. With his spear Aeneas hit Arisba's son, Laocritos, comrade of Lycomedes, and the heart of Lycomedes grieved as he went down. He moved in range, thrust out, and hit Apisae on Hippocides, a captain, in the liver under the ribs. His knees buckled, and he who had come from Paeonia, the best at warfare after Asteropaios, fell to earth. Asteropaios grieved as he went down, and now with generous heart he too attacked but failed to break the Danans, whose line of shields made them a barrier, spear points advanced, compact around Patroclos. Ice it was who passed from man to man saying, no one retreats a step, but no one fights out of line, either, before the rest. Close in around him, fight on, hand to hand. These were great Ias orders. Now the earth grew stained with bright blood as men fell in death close to one another, Trojans, allies, and Danans, too, for they, too, bled, although far fewer died, each one remembering to shield his neighbor from the fatal stroke. So all fought on, a line of living flame. And safe, you'd say, was neither sun nor moon, since all was darkened in the battle cloud, as were the champions who held and fought around the dead Patroclos. The main armies, Trojans and Achaeans under arms, were free to make war under the open sky with sunlight sharp about them, not a cloud appeared above the whole earth or the hills. The armies fought, then rested, pulling back to a good distance, out of range of one another's arrows, quills of groaning. Those in the center, though, endured the cloud with toil of war, and they lost blood as well to heartless bronze, those champions. Two fine men, Thrasymedes and Antilochos, famous both, were unaware of Prince Patroclo's death, thinking he still fought in the forward line. Vigilant to deal with death and rout, these two gave battle on the flank, as Nestor ordered, urging them from the black ships into action. For the other heroes all day long the bout of bitter striving raged, fatigue and sweat, with never a pause, all knees and shins and feet and hands and eyes of fighters were bespattered, around the noble friend of swift Achilles. A man will give his people a great oxide to stretch for him, having it soaked in grease, and grasping it, on all sides braced around it, they pull it till the moisture goes, the oil sinks in, with many tugging hands, and soon the whole expanse is dry and taut. Just so, this way and that way in a little space both sides kept tugging at the body, Trojans panting to drag it off toward Ilion, Achaeans to the decked ships. Round about, wild tumult rose. Ars, frenzy of soldiers, would not have scorned that fight, nor would Athena, even in deadly rage, so murderous the toil of men and chariots for Patroclos that Zeus prolonged that day. Not yet, remember, had Prince Achilles word of his friend's death. Far from the ships this action had gone on under the Trojans' wall, and no clear foresight came to him, Patroclos would, he thought, approach the gates but then turn back, he could not hope alone to take the town by storm. Often Achilles, listening in secret, had learned things from his mother as she foretold the will of mighty Zeus for him. This time she gave no word to him of what calamity had come, that his great friend had been destroyed. But hour by hour the rest fought for the body, gripping wetted spears, dealing out death. And some Achaean veteran might say, old friends, no glory in our taking ship again for home, sooner may black earth here embed us all. That would be better far than giving up this body to the Trojans, a trophy for them, and a glory won. And of the Trojans there were some to say, old friends, if in the end we are cut down alongside this one, just like him, the lot of us, still not a man should quit the fight. That way the Trojans talked and cheered each other on. 
and that was how that battle went, a din of iron-hearted men threw barren air rows to the sky all brazen. Out of range, the horses of Achilles, from the time they sensed their charioteer down in the dust at the hands of deadly Hector, had been weeping. Automedon, the son of Dior's, laid often on their backs his flickering whip, pled often in a low tone, or he swore at them, but neither toward the shipways and the beach by Helias waters would they budge, nor follow Achaeans into battle. No, stock still as a gravestone, fixed above the tomb of a dead man or woman, they stood fast, holding the beautiful war car still, their heads curved over to the ground, and warm tears flowed from under eyelids earthward as they mourned their longed-for driver. Manes along the yoke were soiled as they hung forward under yoke pads. Seeing their tears flow, pitying them, Lord Zeus bent his head and murmured in his heart, Poor things, why did I give you to King Peleus, a mortal, you who never age nor die, to let you ache with men in their hard lot? Of all creatures that breathe and move on earth none is more to be pitted than a man. Never at least shall Hector, son of Priam, ride behind you in your painted car. That I will not allow. Is it not enough that he both has the gear and brags about it? I shall put fire in your knees and hearts to rescue Automedon, bear him away from battle to the decked ships. Glory of killing, even so, I reserve to his enemies until they reach the ships, until sundown, until the dusk comes, full of stars. With this he sent a fiery breath into the horses. Shaking the dust to earth from their long manes, they bore the war car swiftly amid the armies. Automedon gave battle as he rode, though grieving for his friend. Behind the horses in foray like a hawk on geese, with ease he doubled back, out of the Trojan din, then quickly drove full tilt upon the mass, but made no kills, though whipping in pursuit, being single-handed in his car, unable to thrust well with a spear, needing both hands to guide the horses. One of his men at last caught on, one Alcimedon, son of Lex Haemonides, he halted just behind and called out, Automedon, this futile plan of action, which of the gods put you up to it? He took your wits away, fighting alone like this against the Trojans, and in the line, though your companion fell, and Hector himself has got Achilles' arms to swagger in. And to this Automedon, son of Dior's, answered, Alcimedon, what other Achaean has your knack for guiding the divine fire of these horses? Only Patroclos, matchless when he lived, but destiny and death have come upon him. Come then, take the whip and the bright reins, while I step from the chariot into battle. Alcimedon, mounting the swift war car, caught up whip and reins, and Automedon vaulted down. Hector noticed all this, and to Aeneas, near at hand, he said, Counselor of the Trojans mailed in bronze, I've seen that team, Achilles' team, re-enter battle with poor drivers. I might hope to capture it, if you, 4-1, were with me, against the two of us, closing upon it, they would not make a stand or dare give battle. Anchises' noble son nodded, and both went forward, shoulders cased in hardened oxide shields, all plated with a wealth of bronze, and at their heels went Chromios and Aritos, hoping to kill that pair of charioteers and drive the haughty team away. But they were fooled in this, from Automedon's stroke they would not come unblooded. Calling on Zeus, he felt new power surge about his heart, and cried to Alcimedon, his loyal friend, not at a distance from me. Keep the team close up, I, keep them breathing on my back. I do not think Hector Priamides will quit until he mounts this car behind the beautiful horses of Achilles, killing us both, rooting the Argive line, else in the front line he must fall himself. To those called Aias, and to Menelos, he shouted, Aias and Aias, captains of Argives, and you, Menelos, turn the body over to your best men, let them stand by and hold the enemy back. But come yourselves, defend the living, too, the pair of us, ward off our evil hour. Hector and Aeneas, Trojan champions, have put their weight into the painful battle. Now, by heaven, the issue lies upon the gods' great knees, and as for me, I'll make my throw. Let Zeus look after all the rest. Rifling the spear over its long slim shadow, he let fly and hit a Rito circular shield. The surface failed to hold, and the bronze point drove on straight through his belt into the lower belly. As when a rugged fellow with an axe has cleft an ox behind the horns, and cut through all the hump, so the beast rears and falls, a Rito's reared and tumbled back, undone by the long spear still quivering in his bowels. Now with his spearhead flashing, Hector cast at Automedon, who foresaw the cast and doubled forward, dodging under the point. The great shaft punched into the earth behind him, sticking there, vibrating. Burly us deprived it of its force there. Now with swords the men made for each other, hand to hand, but soon the two named Aias broke them apart, shouldering at their friend's call through the press. 
Flurried by these two, Hector and Aeneas, Chromios, too, backed off again, leaving Aretos lying there, his life slashed out of him. Then Automedon, peer in speed of the war god, took the dead man's armor, and vaunting cried, By heaven now I've eased my heart somewhat of anguish for Patroclos, tearing out a man's guts, but no such man as he. Lifting the blood-stained gear into his car, he stepped aboard, his legs and forearms wet with blood, like a lion sated on a bull. Over Patroclos the rough combat widened, loud with oaths and sobs, and from the sky Athena came, kindling the fight, for Zeus who views the wide world, as his humour changed, had sent her down to stiffen the Danans. As when from stormlit heaven he bends a rainbow, omen of war to mortal men, or omen of a chill tempest, pelting flocks and herds, and ending the field work of countrymen, so, folded in a ragged cloud of stormlight, Athena entered the Achaean host. She braced each soldier's will to fight, but first to the son of Atreus, massive Menelaus, she spoke, as he stood near to her. Her form seemed that of Phoenix, her strong voice his voice, the shame of it will make you hang your head, Menelaus, if glorious Achilles' faithful friend is dragged under Troy wall by ravening dogs. Call on your own strength, and put fight in the army. Menelaus, the deep-lunged man of battle, answered her, Phoenix, yes, old-timer, full of years, and may Athena give me force, may she deflect the spears. My will is to defend Patroclos. When he died, it touched my heart. But Hector is a devouring flame, he will not pause, laying about him, Zeus exalts him. At this the grey-eyed goddess secretly took pleasure, that of all the gods he chose to make his prayer to her. Power in his shoulders she instilled, and gristle in his knees, and in his heart the boldness of a shad fly fiercely brushed away, but mad to bite, as human blood is ambrosial drink to him. So furious daring swelled in Menelo's dark chest cave, and he regained his place above Patroclos, levelling his spear. There was a Trojan, son of Aetian, Pods by name, a rich and noble man, whom Hector honoured most in all the realm as his convivial friend. This was the fighter tawny Menelaus hit in the belt as he recoiled, and drove the spearhead through. He went down with a crash. The son of Atreus pulled his body from amid the Trojans over to his own line. Now Apollo standing at Hector's elbow spurred him on. Phaenops Asiates he seemed, who came from Abydos and held first place with Hector of all his foreign friends. In this man's guise the archer Apollo said, would any Achaean fear you now? How openly you shrank from Menelaus, in the past, at least, no tough man with a spear. Just now, alone, he carried off a dead man from the Trojans, a faithful friend of yours whom he had killed, a brave man in attack, Pods, the son of Aetian. Then a cloud of pain darkened the heart of Hector. Amid attackers he went forward, helmed in the fiery bronze. And now the son of Cronos took in hand the storm cloud with its fringe and fitful glare, and hid in cloud mount Ida. Flash on flash he let his lightning fall, with rumbling thunder, shaking the earth. To the Trojans now he gave clean victory, and he routed the Achaeans. First to panic was Penelios the Boeotian, as he turned, face to the front, he took a spear wound in the shoulder just a grazing wound, but one that nicked the bone, from Puladama's point, thrust close at hand, and at close quarters Hector wounded Latos, great Electrian son, on the forearm and put him out of action. He retreated, thinking no longer with one useless hand to fight the Trojans. And as Hector chased him, Idomeneus cast at the Trojan's cuirass, hitting him near the nipple, but the shaft broke off below the point. A cry went up from the Trojan side, and Hector threw in turn at Idomeneus, the son of Deucalion, mounted now in his chariot. By a hair he missed him, but the spear brought down Merion's friend and driver, Coiranos. From Cretan Lictos Coiranos had come along with Merion's. At first, that day, Idomeneus had left the camp and ships on foot, in peril, offering the Trojans a triumph, had not Coiranos driven up full speed and come abreast to be his saviour, shielding him from his evil hour. Coiranos now lost his life to Hector, killer of men, who speared him under jaw and ear and pried his teeth out, roots and all, splitting his tongue. Down from his chariot he fell, dropping the reins to earth. Meriones bent to take them in his own hands, then said to Idomeneus, use your whip to make it to the camp. You know as well as I, there's no fight left in the Achaeans. Away, and toward the ships, Idomeneus lashed his horses with long manes, for fear had entered him at last. Great Aias and Menelaus were not blind, they saw that Zeus accorded victory to the Trojans. Telamonian Aias bowed before it. Damn this day, he said. A fool would know that Zeus had thrown his weight behind the Trojans. 
All their stones and javelins hit the mark, whoever flings them, good soldier or bad. As for ourselves, no luck at all, our shots are spent against the ground. We too, alone, may think what's best to do, somehow to try dragging the body back, as we ourselves return alive to comfort friends of ours. There they are, desperately looking toward us, hopeless now of a pause in Hector's rage, his uncontainable handiwork, they see he'll break in on our black ships. Now if only there was a man to run for it, to bring word to Peleus' son. I think he can't have heard the black report that his dear friend is dead. I cannot anywhere see a runner, though, in this cloud, covering men and chariots. O oh, Father Zeus, come, bring our troops from under the dust cloud, make clear air, give back our sight. Destroy us in daylight, as your pleasure is to see us all destroyed. The father pitied him, seeing his tears flow. He dispersed the cloud, rolled back the battle haze, and sunlight shone, so the whole fight became abruptly clear. Then Aya said to Menelos, Will you use your eyes now, royal friend, to spot, if you can, Antilochos, Nestor's son and a good fighter. Send him on the run to tell Achilles of his dear friend's death. Menelos complied, but slowly, as a lion goes from a farmyard, lagging, tired out with worrying dogs and men who watched all night to keep him from his choice of fatted cattle. Avid for meat, he bounds into attack but has no luck, a hail of javelins thrown by tough cowherds comes flying out at him, and brands of flame from which he flinches, roaring. At dawn he trails away with sullen heart. So Menelos, lord of the great war cry, left Patroclos, hating to go, afraid the panicking Achaeans would abandon him to be their enemy's prey. He lingered long, bidding Meriones and the two named Aias, remember poor Patroclos, each of you, his warmth of heart. He had a way of being kind to all in life. Now destiny and death have overtaken him. Then Menelos turned to search the field, keen as an eagle who has, they say, of all birds under heaven the sharpest eyes, even at a great height he will not miss a swift hair gone to earth under a shady bush, he plummets down straight on him, catches him, and tears his life. So your bright eyes, Prince Menelos, glanced everywhere amid the crowd of soldiers, looking for Nestor's son, if he lived still. And soon enough he found him, on the left flank, cheering his men, sending them into action, and as he reached him red-haired Menelos cried, Antilochos, come here, young prince, and hear sad news. Would God it had not happened. You yourself have seen, I think, by now that God sends ruin surging on our army. Victory goes to the Trojans. Our best man, Patroclos, fell, irreparable loss and grief to the Danans. Here is your duty, run to the ships, tell all this to Achilles, in hope that he can make all haste to save the disarmed corpse, and carry it aboard, though Hector has his armour. Hearing these words appalled and sick at heart, Antilochos lost for a time his power of speech, his eyes brimmed over, and his manly voice was choked. Yet even so he heeded Menelos, handing over his armour to his friend, Laodokos, who turned his team and chariot near to him. Then he set off on the run. And so in tears Antilochos left the battle with evil news for Achilles Pelides. As for you, Menelos, you did not lend a hand to his friends, when he had gone, leaving a great void for the men of Pylos. Rather, Menelos sent Thrasymedes and ran back to Patroclos. There he stood by those named Aias telling them, I found him. Then I sent him shoreward. He will report to our great runner, Achilles. But I doubt Achilles will appear, even though he'll be insane with rage at Hector. Can he come to make war on the Trojans without armor? No, we had better plan it for ourselves, how best to save the dead man, and how best escape death in the hue and cry of Trojans. Telamonian Aias answered, All you say is reasonable, Excellency. Be quick, you and Mary owns, get good leverage under the body, lift it, and lug it back out of the line. We too will stay behind to engage the Trojans and Prince Hector, being alike in name and heart. Often in the past we've waited side by side for slashing ours. At this Menelos and Meriones got their arms under the dead man and gave a great heave upward. From the Trojan mass a cry broke out, as they perceived the Achaeans lifting the body, and they set upon them like a dog pack chasing a wounded boar ahead of young men hunting. For a while they stream out in full cry, ready to rend him, but when he wheels to take them on, staking everything on his own valour, they recoil and swerve this way and that. The Trojans, too, came harrying behind them in a pack with cut and thrust of sword and bladed spear, but when the two named Aias wheeled and stood to menace them, their faces changed, not one dared charge ahead for a contest over the body. 
guarded so, the bearers, might and main, strove on to bring it to the ships. Around them battle spread like a fire that seethes and flares once it has broken out upon a city, houses fall in with flame bursts, as the wind makes the great conflagration roar, so now incessant din of chariots and spearmen beset them on their way. Grim as a mule team putting their strong backs into hauling, down a rocky footpath on a mountainside. A beam or a ship's timber, and their hearts are wearied out, straining with toil and sweat, so these with might and main carried the body. And, close behind, the two named Ias fought their rearguard action. As a wooded headland formed across a plain will stem a flood and hold royal currents, even of great rivers, deflecting every one to wander, driven along the plain, and not one, strongly flowing, can wash it out or wear it down, just so the two named Ias held the fighting Trojans and threw them back. Still they pressed on, and most of all Aeneas Anchisiades with brilliant Hector. As a cloud of starlings or jackdaw shrieking bloody murder flies on seeing a hawk about to strike, he brings a slaughter on small winged things, just so under pursuit by Hector and Aeneas Achaean soldiers shrieked and fled, their joy in combat all forgotten. Routed Achaean's gear of war piled up along the moat, and there was never a respite from the battle.